Today, we live in a world that is designed to reduce our agency. And one of the ways that that happens is through the medical industry. We are sold on solutions that just require a pill. We are sold on passive management of our health rather than being actively involved in the management of our health. And today I'm here with Dr. Garrett Smith to discuss that subject and what men and women can do about it to protect themselves from an industry that doesn't always have our best interests at heart. Welcome, Dr. Smith. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. What kind of doctor are you? So I am a licensed naturopathic physician in the state of Arizona, which means I'm, I'm taught more in the, I tell people I'm a, I'm a doctor of alternative medicine, but um, you know, we can prescribe medications up to a certain point. We can do injections. We can do, there's lots of things that we can do in Arizona. This isn't true for all of the U S but um, yeah, I'm just, I'm a, I'm kind of like an alternative physician in. So alternative life. to what? <laughs> alternative to the, the so-called conventional or um, normal medicine of our day. So yeah, I, um, I'm trained in herbal medicine, uh, nutrition, clinical nutrition, which is the treatment of disease with nutrition. Um, there's hydrotherapy, there's homeopathy, there's, um, you know, we were actually taught uh, what we call physical manipulation, which is very similar to, you know, what people are familiar with, with what they get at a chiropractor. Hmm. Um, so we, we have basically any tools out there. There's specific ones we're taught in school, but any tools that are outside of the medical norm are available and then we also have the the advantage of being able to use tools from the standard realm when we when we choose to interesting yeah i know um my grandfather he used to always say to me that um allopathic doctors what he would always call them so nor normal traditional well not traditional but um, <laughs> right. <laughs> popular medicine uh, doctors uh, they received only a few hours of education on nutrition during the entire years that they're in school and yet most people, even without an understanding of, of health, understand that nutrition is one of the most important things to having good health. And it's interesting that it's so undervalued in the medical establishment. And, you know, nothing happens by accident. Uh, there's, there's obviously a reason why that they're ignoring it. And it's not because that's not an important area. It's because it's not a profitable area. Right. It's well, yeah, I actually, I actually look at it. It's, it's the opposite. It's kind of the, the profitability of it is, is in the opposite direction. I tell people like if, if a farmer knew about certain nutrients in the food and they wanted to put it in their food, so they're going to, they're going to, you know, amend their soil to add certain minerals to it. They may put in like, there's a great little mineral called germanium that almost nobody knows about. And if one farmer puts it in the soil for his food, it's going to increase his costs tremendously. People may get healthier from eating it, but when people are at the, at the store or even the farmer's market, they're going to look at two, you know, apples and they're going to say, well, this one's, they're both organic or whatever. They're, this one's cheaper. So mm -hmm. I want to buy this one. And they, so there's no benefit in the system we have currently. There's no benefit to farmers or anyone trying to put anything more than just the minimum on the shelf. You yeah, I mean, there's, it's what, there's it's what I call it's what I call a natural conspiracy. So it's not like all the farmers got together and said, yeah, we're let's let's not put geranium in the soil. We're gonna we're gonna screw these people out of their geranium. It, and, and then we're gonna save money. It's not that kind of a conspiracy. It's that a whole bunch of people's interests happen to line up in a certain way. And they're the producers. And a lot of the consumers are not sufficiently educated about these subjects. Uh, to have a, a to, for them to line up to have a competing interest in order for the market to balance. Right, right. That was one of the first things I, I thought was funny. And when I was in practice, and I got into giving people magnesium, and magnesium deficiency is rampant. Um, a woman came into my practice, and I was going over her. I do I do um, nutrition testing that includes I do hair mineral analysis, and I do some some nutritional analysis through the blood. And she came in and. She said, wow, that's crazy that you push magnesium so much. She's like, because my dad, he saves dying palm trees for a living. Hmm. And I, I was kind of like, okay, that's okay, cool. What, and, that, and she said, guess what his main thing that he uses is? And I said, well, I have no idea. She said, Epsom salts, magnesium sulfate. Hmm. So he was just treating the, the dying trees with, with the minerals that aren't in the soil, right? So that was an interesting one. I've had other people who are very into soil science tell me soil science and 
and cattle raising that the way I approach things, I, one guy actually asked me if I, I was sure I wasn't a cattle man in the past because of the way I look at things and we want to see the outputs. We want to see people get healthier. Like I, I almost, in a way, I joke that I don't care what your labs do as long as you're getting healthier. If I see you getting healthier, if you feel better, that's the output I want. I, you know, the labs Most are secondary. people don't realize a stud bull probably gets better health care than they do. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Yes. Because you know? they can see what makes them better or not. Yes. And, and they're, they're very quick to align and adopt new ideas. Whereas in, in um, common medicine, in, public, in most medicine, they're very slow to adopt new ideas. And it's gotten worse since the government took over because the government legislates something. So they could legislate something that was killing everyone. In order to change that, you're going to go through two or three legislative cycles till you figure out a solution to it, even after everyone's been convinced. Yes. And then they're, they're also they're trying to fit. To adapt. Right. They're, they're trying to fit. And then, then we start getting, this, this is just a thing of our modern times. We start getting different, you know, I, I, I like to think that in the past when there was more, more separation between genetic groups, that the doctors in that group, because the genetics were so similar, they could easily figure out here's the problem. When you have this problem, this is what's going on. But you start mixing all these different genetics together. And then all of a sudden, which problem from which genetics is coming and mixing and doing this. And it just becomes much harder to figure. And, and then, the, then the government wants to make one solution for everybody, right? Well, any, so any one solution. Tell you that. He'd say that, you know, a flock of, or a herd of Holsteins is ha has to be managed in a different way than say a herd of uh, Angus cows because one is a milk cow, one is a meat cow, one has this need and the other has that need and they need to be managed different. They, they'll, they'll behave differently on pasture. Right. Uh, they need different supplements. Uh, if, yeah. if you talk about that with animals, it's like, well, obviously, you know, that, that has to be that way. But if you make that argument for people, uh, it's very controversial. Yes. That kind of an argument. It's, it's not, that people disagree with you, they don't like you making the argument. Right, right. I, I talk to people about, well, they're, they're like, well, my, my mom was this and my dad was this. And my mom did all the cooking in the house. So I grew up eating whatever ethnic food it was. And I say, well, what if, you, what if your genetics towards food was more of your dad's? And that's totally opposite. And then they're like, well, my dad died in his 50s from a heart attack. And it's like, well, maybe the food wasn't the right food for him and maybe maybe you look like your mom more but you got your dad's food genes and it just becomes modern medicine has become so much more difficult because of the 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 mixing of the genetics which just makes it just mixes everything and then you don't know what you're you're dealing with and then everything has to be trial and error so you can figure out what works for you and what doesn't because we don't know which one came in so Anyway, well, and you have some, uh, some populations, uh, such as the Irish in certain places that basically lived off of fish, dairy products, and, and potatoes. They ate right. things. They didn't, they didn't have vegetables. For them, a vegetable was turnips, you know. <laughs> they right. didn't really have vegetables. They didn't have green vegetables. They didn't have any kind of fruit, um, some berries once in a while. And it was a, considered a dessert. It was right. what we might think of now as being, you know, a sweet it wasn't something yes. every day. They might have apples and their apples were this big and so bitter <laughs> that a modern person wouldn't eat them. Right. And absolutely. They're now living in a society where they're eating, you know, they're, they're having tropical fruit and, uh, and some sushi with rice and a bunch of other things that their ancestors never ate and never developed a, a balance for that. It right. makes it very hard. Oftentimes we, we talk about how we wish we had more choices. But the reality is, is too many choices actually makes life more complicated and can lower our quality of life. Yes. Yes. I have people with, with some of the nutrition stuff I do, people go, well, but wait, I can't eat this. I can't eat this. And I'm like, people used to eat like three things and you're complaining that you only have like 90 things to choose from. Yeah. <laughs> the, the illusion of choice, right? The illusion of all that. So, um, but yeah, one of the things I do a lot of is I, well, we were talking about agency here. And one of the big things, one of the naturopathic principles that I, that I take to heart, it makes, it makes my job a little more challenging. So, well, a lot more challenging than a lot of doctors sometimes is the, the it's docere, which is, do, you know, they, they translate it as doctor as teacher. 
Mm. And so one of the biggest, some people who come to me, they start seeing all the material I have and they're like, whoa, this is a lot of stuff. And I'm like, I'm trying to teach you what to do so you can be healthy. And, and eventually you might still need me for interpretations of labs and other stuff like that. But hopefully you're getting healthier the whole time. And over time, you don't need me as much. My goal is to make you not a patient, not a client. To have you, you know, we might need to do the labs to see what's going on inside of you. But once I give you the, the tools and once you learn your body and you, you actually open your mind to this makes me feel good, this doesn't. Well, maybe even Dr. Smith gave me this supplement, but I don't feel good on it. What I tell people is don't take it, right? I don't know everything about every body. If I give you something that, that in the rare op case that it doesn't feel good, you are to not take it, email me, tell me what's going on because that gives me more insight into what's going on in your body. I can teach you about that and then we can avoid that whole problem in the future. It's, so, kind, of, um, it's kind of an experimental search for what is the dietary truth for that individual. Yes, yes. And, and I get into diet in terms of nutrition. Nutrition is everything that comes into the body and, and, is, and is leaving the body at the same time. So that's nutrition involved. You know, people will say, well, that's detoxification, but nutrition actually in the, in the dictionary is everything that goes in and out. Hmm. And so other things I teach people is, you know, the, the best way to, everybody likes to talk about detoxification. And I say, well, the, the best way, you know, garbage in, garbage out, right? The best way to detox is to stop intoxing. So we have to figure out when we have, like, when I see aluminum on a hair test, Okay, we got like aluminum cans, soda cans, beer cans, Tetra packs, those things that like soy milk, rice milk, broth comes in. Those are line, those have aluminum in the liner. There's, you know, oh, you'd baking be surprised on how many people bake a casserole or a or um, lasagna with tin foil, tin uh, foil on top, right. and it cooks right into the lasagna. And I yes. see people eat it. Yes. I yes. see people eat the little pieces of tin foil and go, oh, it's no problem. I'm a man, I can handle it. And it's like, oh, no. You, 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 here's, you want some lead too? Right. You want some um, lead in that tin? That, that uh, I had not seen people actually eating the aluminum, but, but I do have research showing that if there's aluminum in the cooking process, like even if it's not touching the food, it still gets aluminum in the food. And then people are trying to be Ask here in the welder. Aluminum yeah. off gases when yes. you melt it. Right. Every, every welder so will tell you that. There was aluminum pots and pans, aluminum baking sheets, like, and so we start going, people will go camping once or twice and they'll make some, you know, fish with lemon and dill in a, in a aluminum foil, right? In the fire. Just one of those exposures, that is massive exposure. Mm. Um, the, the paper I have, that same paper showed that the more acidic the stuff that was in there, the more aluminum it leached and the more, the more herbs and spices were in there, the more it leached. And so then we go, oh, salmon with dill and lemon juice. That's like recipe for disaster. Not, not, to, not to even mention the mercury that's in the salmon. Um, but so we just start going, what are the, we can see the exposures that people have. We can then, you know, mitigate them. We can say, you know, if, if I see mercury on somebody's hair test, I'm like, the mercury on a hair test is from fish and shellfish. It's not amalgams. It's from fish and shellfish. That's the, that's the way the, the HPLC works. It only measures the, the methyl mercury. I live in the land of fish and shellfish. <laughs> and I eat so, almost only meat, but. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't eat any fish and shellfish anymore. Um, because of what I've seen in the mercury, there's mercury in all fish and shellfish, and it shows up on a hair test guaranteed. And Even I just. Even stuff don't from see the North Pacific? Pretty much. I can make a very good estimate of how often people eat fish from the mercury level on their hair test. It's, hmm. it's pretty uncanny. Um, usually the only time that I'm wrong is I under guess because people are either eating sushi, which hmm. is just off the charts, or they're eating some fish that's higher than I'm used to seeing. Hmm. Um, and then people will say shrimp doesn't have any mercury in it. And I'm like, it's not what the hair tests say. I, you know, they can, they can say it all they want, but when I have people who eat just prawns or shrimp and I see their mercury is really high, I just go, that's what they told you. That's not what we're seeing here. Well, people are then, also eating farm shrimp, which is probably much higher in mercury than wild caught. I you know. Again, I just show them. I'm just like, here's the mercury. There's what you're eating. Here's what it is. If you were to cut your intake in half, 
we would see the mercury level drop by half. And they're like, well, I want it gone. And then I say, well, then you cut it out. <laughs> it's, that's how it works. It's really that dose dependent on some of the work I do. So, and had mercury always been in fish um, for thousands of years, or is this something that's more a result of more modern pollution? Yeah, you know, I, I don't tend to, that's one of those things that it's, it's a little bit, and there's, this is nothing against the question. It's a little bit of mental masturbation. Like it doesn't help, it doesn't help move it doesn't forward. Like it, it's in the fish now. You know, 5,000 years ago, was there mercury in the fish or not? I don't know. It doesn't, it's not affecting me now. I'm only dealing with the fish now, right? So I kind of try to, I try to take the burden off people of like, it, it, don't worry about all the, the details that, you know, it's like somebody said, well, what about dinosaurs? Did they ever exist? I'm like, I never saw them. You know, how long ago were they here? I don't know. The scientists told me the carbon dating. I don't know if they're right. Could they be lying? I don't know. It doesn't, does it really matter? Do dinosaurs impact my life on a daily basis? So that's kind of, I try to take, I'm like, here's the world we live in. These are the toxins we know are affecting us. These are the toxins that we haven't been told are affecting us, but we can probably be pretty sure, you know, like the next thing that Monsanto comes out with, am I going to trust it <laughs> after agent orange and DDT and now glyphosate, they don't get any trust anymore. So I'm going to, that, that's where, you know, they've lost the trust. So we're going to assume that they're bad. Um, but yeah, the, one of the biggest things that I find does the biggest impact is just eliminating the highest problem sources of toxicity because people on the internet they'll go into every like you wouldn't be able to leave your house you'd have to live in a little cocoon because everything's toxic but that old story of the uh that professor with the rocks in the jar you know that one no, the no. big rocks oh oh so uh, oh, super quick you know that you know the poor sanded yes yeah. yes so um i always tell people like we worry about the big rocks first don't worry about the other stuff until you got the big rocks. So like, get clean water. There we go. Don't be eating glyphosate. When you, when you say clean water, what, what do you mean by that? What would you suggest is the, the technique for this making is, your water clean? This is where, you know, people in the, in the alternative world get kind of crazy. And I tend to, I understand the energetics of water and all of that. I tend to, because I have to deal with people, I deal, I have clients, we counted 20 different countries in the world. So to deal with water in each of those countries is, is a daunting task. Um, I tend to go with, with, with the, with the lack of trust that I feel that we can have in governments to clean water with the lack of trust that I have in the groundwater, especially in farming areas with, with the lack of trust, around that subject and how important a subject is, I would rather have cleaner, overly clean water rather than risk yeah. something being there. So um, I go with just, you know, I, I use a uh, Berkey at my house, but if I, if when I go up the next level, I'm going to reverse osmosis or a distiller. Yeah. I was um, going to suggest, suggest or ask, would a, would a Berkey be sufficient? So it's good to know. Cause it's, it's, the reverse osmosis isn't a, available to everyone because, you know, if you live in an apartment you're renting, you might not be allowed to install it. Right. The Actually, there is um, it's, Aqua, it's, it's Aqua Pure. Aqua Pure is, I think it's Aqua Pure. I always get it confused if it's Aqua True, T-R-U or Aqua Pure is a countertop reverse osmosis. Oh, excellent. Um, and I, I make no money from them. No. Uh, Gr growing up, my family used reverse osmosis because the... Um, the the tap water where we lived always tasted like bleach and right. we had a couple of times somebody put a, a dead body in the water um what they put it in where the water exited the treatment plant so oh, man. it just exits the treatment plant and then hits a dead body and this would happen every couple of years and it would take three or four months to figure it out in the meantime if you drank the water you'd vomit oh my god and this is a major first world city in, in, a, in a highly developed country and they couldn't keep the water clean. Yeah. So that's why I, I, I tell people like, do not drink water that hasn't been filtered, at least. I mean, at least something, yeah. filter something. I mean, even, even those charcoal filters that are in like a Brita, those pitchers, that actually 
activated charcoal filters have been shown to remove glyphosate. Hmm. Uh, better than nothing, you know. So people will say, oh, but I get my water from this spring and, uh, you know, and I'm like, Has, have you tested it? Yeah. I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I can't, I can't just say I trust it. I had a woman this morning who has a whole house filter on her house and she distills her drinking water. And I looked at her hair test and her copper on her hair test was off the charts. Hmm. Her blood copper was only a little high, but her hair copper was off the charts. And I said, that looks like contamination. Now I had one lady who had a water distiller, whole house water distiller in her house. Something about it was wrong and it was putting copper in the water. Probably had a and copper boiler or something. She said it was like a, there was a floating ball in it that would all get all this copper, you know, the blue green copper, the oxidized copper on it. And the guy had to replace it. She said, I don't know if this matters anything, but they had to replace this ball because it got copper on it like three times. And I was like, wait. And then I started looking into her issues, which were colitis and then copper in the water in regards to colitis. And I just, I go through the research. This is what I do. And then I was like, and then I had her test her water, the tap water versus the distiller water. The distiller water was full of copper. Hmm. See, you keep coming back around to the same thing. It's you must test. You must test. But and I have a saying. I, I think that. that's, an, that's very hard for people because they're like, give me a solution. I don't want to spend money on tests. I just want a solution. I'm, I'm surprised how many people say, I think my testosterone is low and I'm going to go take testosterone supplementation. I've heard lots of guys say this. And everyone is screaming at them like, go get a test. And like, tests are expensive. <laughs> you know? Well, yeah, it's how expensive is it to fix the problem later? I, ha I have a saying for what I do. It's, it's test. We test, we don't guess, then we address. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's just very straightforward. Like if somebody says, well, I don't think I have a magnesium deficiency because I read this guy and he said, most Americans don't have a magnesium deficiency. And I'm like, here's a hair test. We look at your calcium and your magnesium to see how they are relative to each other. And then we just go in and, and if somebody told me, well, I feel better when I put magnesium, do topical magnesium, and I, I just feel better. Then I'm like, you're deficient. That's all there is to it. Magnesium is not a stimulant. No. It's just a mineral. <laughs> every, and, every client I have, I recommend that they take magnesium. Uh, I'm adjusting that recommendation. I'm saying take the magnesium and go to Dr. Garrett Smith to get actual tests <laughs> to see if you're not taking enough because you might even need to take more. That, I, I, mean, I find myself... Um, I take about twice the magnesium they say, and I feel way better than when I take exactly the dose they say it should be take for my body weight. Now, so you're doing pills? Yeah. Okay. And I'm, I'm extremely active person. I'm working out. I'm chasing kids. I'm uh, you know, chasing my little kids around. And uh, I'm, I'm thinking all the time. I'm always working with my mind. And if I go on vacation and I don't take the magnesium, pretty much fine. But if I'm working, I need it. Otherwise, I run out of brain power. So this is like a fun thing on that. So, so you're having to take twice what they recommend, right? Mm -hmm. It might um, not be absorbing well is my thought. but I've, I found on the hair testing, I, used to, I wanted to use pills. I wanted to use pills in my practice because they're easier, right? The topical is kind of a pain, can feel a little weird on the skin, depending upon that. I, I have like six different methods that people can choose from. But in the end, I came, I came up with the, I came up with the arbitrary, um, it, it is arbitrary, but I, I believe that topical magnesium works about 10 times as well as pills. Wow. That's my belief. That's what I see on hair tests. So I tell people like, you can try, if, if I see on a hair test, I had somebody yesterday who was one of the rare ones. She was taking magnesium pills and I look at her hair test and her magnesium is, is relative to her calcium. Everything's good. And I went, you can keep taking it like it's working for you. So go ahead. I said, I, th I think she actually said to me though, I think she said, well, when I do a magnesium bath, I do feel better. Hmm. And I was like, oh, well, okay, maybe we're not getting enough. Um, and yeah, that uh, is an important measure is, do you feel better when you do this thing? It is an important measure. A lot of people's self-reporting isn't very good. If I'm testing something like how much magnesium to take, I'll take notes. Yeah. And Oh, at five o'clock, I ran out of brain energy. Oh, no, I doubled the dose. Now I'm good until 10 o'clock. Nice. I got extra five hours. Okay, probably I need to take more. Right, right. 
or, or we figure out how to absorb it better or we figure out a better type. You know, this is the stuff I get into that other people don't like magnesium glycinate has glycine in it. So you get, you have a secondary effect. You have the chelate. So you can have the glycine amino acid having an effect versus magnesium taurate. You have taurine having an effect. And so most people just talk about the bioavailability of them and they're like, well, that's, and I'm like, that's important, of course. But if somebody said, well, I took magnesium glycinate and I felt anxious and I couldn't sleep, then I'd say, well, have you tried anything else? And they'll say, well, I don't like magnesium. I don't take it. I say, have you tried anything else? And they're like, no. And I'm like, well, it could be the glycine. You may not get along with glycine. It's a rare thing, but it happens. So maybe we just go to a different thing. So yeah, again, we're coming back to what I do with people on my programs is I give them email support with me and I, you know, I tell them to email me when there's a problem. And then, and then the key thing is that they tell me in that first email, what exactly are you taking? So I can look at what's going on and look at what you're taking because, you know, I give people, a, a, you know, my, my treatment plan of things to take, but they may or may not take it all. They might add things to it. They might not take it all. And so if they just say, I'm on the treatment plan, I'm like, no, <laughs> I need to know what you are taking. Um, so anyway, it's, it's fun. It's, it's really, I might, my nickname that I, you know, my nickname is uh, the nutrition detective. And that's really, uh, you know, what we're trying to do, we're trying to figure out the, the, I learned this in school. I'm big on philosophy. We could talk about, you know, Propertarianism and, and some of the, the principles of naturopathic medicine, which should be the principles of all medicine, if we if we decide to. Yeah, I think after, after the point you're making now, well, actually, that's what we should we should discuss. Oh well, it was just I, I loved philosophy in naturopathic medical school, and I, I feel like when you have a, a true, solid, strong philosophy, decisions are easy, right? Um, it was. He said, give the, this was the philosophy teacher in school. We had a philosophy class. It was give the body what it needs, help it get rid of what it doesn't want, and then get the hell out of the way. And I was like, I, I kept that forever. And I was like, yeah, that's just, you know. So I tend to think of give the body what it needs primarily is essential macronutrients and micronutrients, right? The essentials first, because if your car only has three spark plugs and it's supposed to have four, it's not going to run right. So we make sure the essentials are in place first. We help the body get rid of what it needs. We figure out the toxins that are poisons that are they're being exposed to, toxins, heavy metals, like mold toxicity in people's houses. I'm very honest with people about mold toxicity in their house. I'm like, if you have mold toxicity in your house, you will not get better on any program. They will continue to, you know, usually the mold gets worse, right? The mold gets stronger. And they're, it's just overwhelming them. I have people who are, you know, they got mold in their house. They take supplements. Any supplement, even stuff that's supposed to be good for them will make them feel worse. Mm -hmm. We start getting into the mechanics of that. Why does that happen? They take something that starts ramping up their body's own detox processes, right? So they've got mold toxins coming in and their body starts kicking out mold toxins. So now their blood is completely full of mold toxins. They're worse than they were before. So then they stop taking the supplement, the detox slows down, and they feel better, right? <laughs> Back to how they used to feel, but they're still not any better. Well, there's and a I reason why companies that remove mold, they treat it about like you treat asbestos. They take very similar precautions to what they take for asbestos. You know, you have to wear full uh, hazmat suits, and the area where it's being removed has to be under a tent and everything. It's right. It's considered extremely dangerous by companies that deal with it on a regular basis. And I've seen people, oh, yeah, the, the black roof in my bathroom is fine. It's the color right, of right. the background. And, oh, yeah, that's <laughs> fine. No problem. Right. And, I, I mean, that was, that was a cool thing I saw about we had mold remediation done in a, in a house that we um, – another property we have. And uh, they, tested, they tested before and they tested after. And that's like, they had to make sure that it was gone. And I was like, that's, that's my kind of thing, you know? Um, so, but yeah, so we can get into those, uh, we can get into those principles now, but yeah, we just want to know what we're dealing with and we want to know the things that would block progress and like mercury fillings, like mercury fillings are poisoning people every day, right? Every day, every time you drink something hot or you chew, mercury vapor is coming off and you're absorbing it. I tell people, like, if you start working with me and you have mercury fillings, we can start work. 
you need to put getting those mercury fillings out of your mouth with a with a good biological dentist at some point you need to make plans for that that needs to be part of it and even still i tell with the mold thing i'll tell people this is just me being this is this is reciprocity in action i will tell people do not if you don't have the money to work with me and get the mold removed get the mold removed don't spend it on me yet. Don't waste it on me. I'm, I'm not your tool yet. Take the money and put it towards the mold because that's, that's what I'd want somebody to tell me. You know, I don't need to jerk people around and think they're going to get better when they're not going to get, when I know they're not going to get better. So er, everybody's got a finite, you know, most people have finite money. So put it towards that. Yeah. You know? And, and, and always, this is when going back to philosophy is deal with first things first. Yes. You no. Know, uh, there, there is an order in which to solve our problems, and you know, you go into the doctor and you have a knife sticking out of you. You're not going to complain that your tooth hurts. You know. Right. Right. <laughs> Do we deal with a knife first, and you know, <laughs> deal with my tooth after? And yeah. when you have, and and I still think it's good they go to you at first because there may be things in their environment that they don't know about, and right. you can start going through them. You know, Do you have mold in your house? No. How do you know you don't have mold in your house? Well, actually, you know what I do often is I start working with people. I don't always go over mold in the first thing, but I start working with them. And if, especially if I have people who are like every single supplement I take always makes me feel worse. I'm like, that's like mold just beep. <laughs> and I'm going, we got to look into this and they'll say, well, my husband, you know, I, I had a woman the other day. My husband says we don't have mold. He, he's positive. We don't have mold. I was like, have you been tested? No. Okay. You know, because I, th I think a lot of people are scared to death of the costs or the problem that finding mold could be. And the, the problem becomes often I see with, with men and women, the problem is, the challenge is women get sicker from mold first. They're in the house more than men are. Men, men tend well, to be out of the house. They work longer could, hours. Could be that. I see differences in minerals like, like women can tolerate higher, higher hair calcium levels before they get as sick as men, whereas men can tolerate much higher iron levels than women can. So there's, there's, there are differences in how we tolerate stuff. I mean, the calcium thing may be estrogen related. I don't know. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. I just, you know, a man over 100 on hair calcium is a disaster. And women can pull, you know, 200s. I've seen a 700 on a woman. And a, and a man, I, I'm positive that a man at 700 would be dead of a heart attack. <laughs> So it's just different tolerances, but yeah, the, the mold there is there. That is a good observation. They are typically in the house more, but I just see them get sick. And then the, then the, the men often go, well, we, we don't have that problem. And I'm like, got to at least get the test. The test is 20 bucks. Like just do the test. You know why don't spend hundreds of dollars on me. Just spend 20 bucks on the test. Make sure it's not there. So we don't waste a bunch of time because I do use supplements. My goal is to get people, to the point where we are only doing the minimal amount of supplements that they need to increase their quality of life and, and counteract any deficiencies that are in the food that we can't address, you know, at the farmer level and, um, you know, make it so they understand most of the time we're finding as we get them better that they don't, the supplement list is shrinking. That's always been a goal, philosophically a goal of mine. We don't want to have to have people on supplements. And we, we were talking earlier about it's not just adding to your diet. Right. It's first making sure you're not eating things that are, and you, we mentioned uh, aluminum in food and stuff like yes. that. To make sure you're not consuming things because you, you can't consume garbage and take some supplements to fix the problem. Yes. That's that passivity that I mentioned earlier. No, don't, don't change your habits. Uh, just take this pill. And right. a lot of people, even when they go to a naturopathic doctor, they will still come with their allopathic ideas of everything can be solved with a pill, but I just want a natural pill. Oh, and yeah, right, right. I think that is, is stopping a lot of people from uh, that combined with the, the long-term indoctrination that we get in school that we need, you know, our diet should be mostly grains and vegetables. This is this is a this is an indoctrination, and it would be nice though if we could hold the people accountable that have been telling us this unhealthy stuff and and making us sick for so long. 
But as individuals, it doesn't help to complain about it. We just have to take this, take control over this ourselves. Yeah, I, I get into. I think I think humans are quite adaptable to different to different foods, and I, I have certain things. So so the things I generally have people avoid. I won't go into them on this on this broadcast. But there there are certain um, chemicals in food that you know I just have people avoid those. And if they can, there are grains that avoid those. There's meat that avoids those. There's vegetables that avoid those. So we they can. <laughs> this is why, as an example, there are people out there thriving on an all potato, all white potato diet, and there's people out there doing the all beef, water, salt carnivore diet, and they're both doing quite well. And Somewhere I can tell in the you, is my ideal diet: meat, right, and right, and meat and potatoes, it. right? Meat, well, th potatoes, this, get, and butter. That's my diet. That's my diet. So, so get this: most of us know, an typically. It may, he may have passed on by now, but an older gentleman who lived on steak and potatoes, right? And he lived to, you know, this guy might have lived to late 80s, early 90s, something like that. And everybody goes, how did he live so long? He did everything wrong. And I go, nope, there was something very specific in that steak and potatoes that he was not eating. And that's why. So we see people who do the carnivore diet. We see people do the potato diet. Put them together. It's still missing that same thing. My grandpa's neighbor died at 105. My grandpa saw him, and he only died because they put him in an old age home, and mm -hmm. he was too healthy to be in the old age home. The week before they put him in the old age home, he was showing my grandpa that he could bend one of those giant nails. He could bend it in half like this. He was 105 years old. He could <laughs> run at 105 years old. Wow. All he ate was meat and potatoes, and he would drink uh, a, a one liter bottle of cream every day. One liter bottle of cream. Wow. Yeah, that was his breakfast was a one liter bottle of cream right from uh, his own cow. <laughs> <sighs> Turns my stomach a little bit to think about that much fat, but it's, it's more know. fat than I would consume. But he lived to be 105. I think I eventually got used to it. Right. Well, there, there's certain, yeah, there, everybody has tolerances of certain things. Yeah. So certain things can, people can get away with. And then certain things, once they're kind of that, that threshold is past then things tend to fall apart <laughs> pretty quick or when he went in that home they might have changed his diet drastically mm -hmm. yeah he died within a month or so after going to the old age home everyone says it's over it's from despair but he wasn't tied down he could have moved around anywhere he wanted and he had his own room uh, but right. it could have been that change in diet uh we yeah. know we know that he had to eat the diet of the old age home that just yes. would have had to happen he couldn't yes. and and he my grandpa said he literally his his life was he'd boil some potatoes and because his wife had passed and he would take his take a steak and sear it on each side and eat it and that's what yep. that was his lunch and dinner and that's nice. all he ate he never ate anything else because other things were too <laughs> complex and he didn't want to spend time cooking them wow yep i so that's there there's there so what we do is you know just like in business success leaves clues right mm -hmm. so then we can look at what he was doing or not doing and then try to figure out what is what is the common thread running through all that that is is probably linking all of them so that's you'll, that's you'll what see I'm, people that smoke like mad until they die at 100 years old never have any problems with their lungs other people get lung cancer and other kinds of cancers and they ate healthy all their life yeah i could go into that too <laughs> <laughs> and it is it is interesting to look if if we could have enough of those people to make make actual studies but for the individual what is important is to actually understand things and we, we talked about philosophy and one of the cornerstones of philosophy is that you have to know yourself yes you know, any kind of personal philosophy that you want to use to improve yourself you have to know and understand yourself it's really the beginning of agency is knowing yourself um, and most people don't really know themselves. They didn't used to have to. If you lived with all, you know, you lived in an Irish village and everyone was basically a second cousin. <laughs> and you've been living there for a thousand years eating the same, well, not potatoes, because we haven't had a thousand years of potatoes, but you've been eating the same basic food during a hundred generations. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very easy to know what to eat. You just eat what you get given by your wife or mother, you know? Right. 
you don't you don't have to think about it and you've only got like five choices of things to eat and they're making some combination make each meal (laughs) you know basically there's no difference between breakfast lunch and dinner it's all the same thing it sounds sounds a little boring but you don't have to think about food you can think about other things right and if somehow your genetics aren't well adapted to that food you'll die or not have many kids and the people that survive are the ones who are going to be good with that food and now we're so mixed around that we're and we're eating experimenting with other people's diets that we're not well adapted to it's very hard to manage our our health and yes. you know we you didn't need 200 years ago you didn't need anyone to tell you what you needed to eat because you're you know, eat what i grew up on <laughs> right well you're gonna eat what's available yeah you're gonna eat yeah. what i grew up on and eat what's available it's not always <laughs> there's not always a lot of choices in in anything so yeah, it's, um, it's interesting. I mean, I'm mostly Scandinavian. So, I mean, fish would be a, I, I feel like I do really well on fish, but I, I, you know, I have to make choices in the modern world in the context of where we live. And, you know, when I'm, when I keep seeing research coming out that the fish has cocaine and benzos and rocket fuel and mercury and all these things and I'm like, and those fish lead wild lives. Right, right. Um, it's yeah, crazy party out there. Um, I just look at it and I go, I can't, I can't justify, I mean, I, I used to go to bed. This was, this was an interesting little experiment, little learning thing I did. I used to go and eat sushi before I, before I was into all of this. And every time I'd go to bed, I would have heart palpitations and I couldn't fall asleep until about midnight. And I was thinking, what is it? So me being kind of the scientist mind that I am, every time I'd go to eat sushi, I would change a variable. You know, I'd get the low sodium soy sauce or I'd get no sushi rice or I'd skip the beer or whatever. Nothing helped until one day I was going to go to an all you can eat sushi place, which is scary enough. But um, I thought That's before when I st- high quality sushi, right? The really high you quality, right? Limit. If it was like if sushi wasn't the bad enough, all you can eat sushi is going to have the the lowest quality fish you could possibly get. Um, anyway, so. I had some chelator pills, some, some pills of, you know, toxic metal chelating agent, DMSA. And I thought, you know what I'm going to do? What if it's mercury or cadmium in the fish that I'm eating? Why don't I go and I'll take these right when I sit down to eat? And the theory was, if I, fe- if I sleep fine afterwards, if everything's fine, then we now know it was toxic metals in the fish. And if it doesn't work, then it wasn't that. Went and I ate the sushi. I took the pills, ate sushi, slept like a baby, had no problems. And that's when I went, uh, I can't eat that anymore. <laughs> and I think, I think I've only had sushi once or twice in the, in the five or six years since then. And I really have no interest in it anymore. You know, here in Portugal, um, it's a, a diet large, we're on the coast. It's a lar- diet yeah. largely composed of fish. However, when you're pregnant, the doctor says, no more than two fish meals a month. So they're Keep saying they know it's poison. <laughs> yeah. So what the doctor's saying is it's poison. But right. if you don't have, if you're not pregnant, we're okay with how much you want to kill yourself. Right, right. Yeah. We're, we're not going to see the obvious changes we just don't like want birth defects. To, to make a bunch of birth defects that we'll then have to pay for. Right. The right. health system. That's, that's where, you know, a lot of things that people don't realize, they'll, people will often try to get away with, you know, the poison is in the dose, which is true. However, the thing we can counter that with is how much poison does it take? Mm. Just enough. And then when do you know that you've passed that point? Only when you're there. <laughs> so well, I'm and, kind and, of like, and you don't have when when you get recommendations that you, you know, any level of mercury above X is toxic. Those are made in the absence of other potential poisons that your body might have to be dealing with. Right. So if you're at 90% level in 10 different poisons, oh, well, I tested everything and you're fine. You're still dying. Or, or even just, uh, you know, the synergy of them. I, I think it was mercury and cadmium that were amazingly synergistic in their toxicity. Um, and I have a paper showing that uh, retinoic acid, vitamin A, with cadmium is synergistically toxic. So even with I can imagine that vitamin A would increase the intake uh, or the absorption of things like mercury and cadmium because it is a mineral 
uptake increase or it, yeah it it's it's extremely vitamin a is an extremely misunderstood topic that has to be looked at from first of all it has to be looked at from a new lens um because even the institute of medicine just drastically reduced by 40 percent the amount they suggest adults consume in a day hmm. and why would they do that why would they all of a sudden reduce the amount that we need while taking the restriction or taking the requirement to show vitamin a on nutrition labels in the u.s off and it's interesting how many foods are fortified with vitamin a which makes it almost impossible unless you eat I mean, I don't eat anything that comes in a box, but uh, unless you eat only raw ingredients that you've right. prepared yourself, you don't know how much vitamin A you're taking. You have no clue because yes. you could have just eaten three times a daily dose of vitamin A in, in some packaged product that you ate. You have no idea. There's only two known neurotoxic vitamins. One is B6 and the other is vitamin A. So you get too much of them and you get neurotoxicity, which shows up as things like with when people take um, uh, the, the worst kind of vitamin A, when they take uh, Accutane, suicide and uh, permanent sexual dysfunction and even even death. So, yeah, it's, that it's, sounds like you're that sounds like the modern population. Suicide rate skyrocketing, vitamin A supplementation in the diet skyrocketing. Yeah, I mean, this is we're opening a can of worms now. Yeah, this I, is my I specialty. It, um, it, it's, it's at least it's correlation. If it's not causation, at least we have correlation. And I think very often the, the start to understanding these things is admitting that it's possible. Yes. Well, and then also, yes, for, for the, obviously the, the people, the, I mean, people don't realize that, that scientific studies are built on anecdotes. So some people will come to me and they'll say, well, where's all this, the hard science that says this? And I say, well, every scientific study came somewhere from an anecdote where somebody said, oh, I saw this happened, you know, maybe we'll study it and we'll get more people to do it. So, so we have plenty of anecdotes now. Um, Grant Jenneru is, is kind of the, the leader of the modern vitamin A is, is not a nutrient, is only a poison um, movement. His website's G Jenneru, G-E-N-E-R-E-U-X dot blog. Um, he opened my mind to it. And then what I do, what I specialize in is taking a good idea, even the, the, the black sheep out there ideas, and then putting it all into context. I mean, I had somebody who's a nutritionist the other day sending me how they got, how they figured out they got vitamin A toxic. They were probably genetically predisposed to it, but there was medication A, then medication B, then medication C. And all the while, you know, there's the cod liver oil, there's, there's, um, eating, trying to eat a rainbow of vegetables, which that idea has only really been popularized since 2005. That's not a traditional idea. Our, our um, ancestors ate, I remember reading about early American settlers, their diet was about 85% meat. Oh yeah. Well, when you get into, I, I, somebody sent me once, one of my clients, they sent me a link to the foods mentioned in the Bible. And if you were to look at the foods mentioned in the Bible, it was a low vitamin A diet. Somebody sent me pictures of a book about, um, I think it was, was it the 1800s? It was, it was a, a farmer going to market in the 1800s and everything that he was going to sell, you know, it was stuff like turnips and, and I mean, um, garlic. Uh, yeah. It was all white foods. Yeah. Generally you can be, you can be pretty safe in knowing that white foods don't have any carotenoids, which is a form of vitamin A. And so that, that, that if you figure the farmer's eating what they're growing, right? So they were eating a low vitamin A diet. So we look in the past and we go, what's happened? And we get, like you were saying, there's vitamin A fortification. There's the encouragement of eating a wide color variety of foods. And all pretty much oranges and yellows and many of the reds are full of vitamin A. Then does, we does have- Does that include red berries? No, no. Okay. That's, like, that's, like red from, that's red from proanthocyanidins. This is, that's, okay. that's like the same, the same type of stuff that makes grapes red. So grapes are, so that's why I say most reds, but, mm -hmm. um, or many reds, definitely tomatoes. That's for sure. But anyway, we get into the, they're putting it in cosmetics now, retinol. There's the cod liver oil fad. There's the eating liver fad. There's dairy is a, dairy is a 
bomb of dairy is what I call the perfect storm of vitamin A toxicity, but it, it always depends on what you feed the cow, right? So the cow only makes what it's fed. So we get into, they're adding vitamin A to sunscreens now. And if there's anything that they know about vitamin A on the skin, it's vitamin A makes you more sensitive to sun damage. They have done studies that they were comparing Eastern European women mm -hmm. uh, who never heard of sunscreen, but love to be out in the sun. If the sun's out, they're out in the sun getting suntans. Uh, and they're just as white as as can be, and they're right. comparing them with uh, I think it was Australians uh, that were out in the sun all the time, slathered in sunscreen, and sun skin cancer in the Eastern European women was close to nothing. No, nobody heard of it. Well, what's this? Right. We've never heard of it in Australia. It's one out of three. Yeah, it's and they they felt it was either the sunscreen or. Uh, makeup that they were using that was that had chemicals in it and then even when the makeup was off their skin had absorbed it they went oh, out yeah. the sun and it made them weaker well so we would get into two things with that one one the, the most obvious one would be uh, so it's known that the sun breaks down the vitamin a that it can hit in the skin hmm. this is known and so, it does penetrate light actually penetrates especially if you're as white as me <laughs> it right, penetrates right. um deeper into the skin than people realize not just the very surface right so so that we have the vitamin a destroying the the i mean sorry the sun destroying the vitamin a in the skin then we have even in, in the u.s they're adding vitamin a to some sunscreens and then people wonder why they're burns like what i have a whole thread actually i, I may i'm going to post on my website a facebook um post of mine where a bunch of people i talked about how what I'm, what I'm hearing from clients is that people's heat tolerance, like I've heard you mention how hot it is where you are, and I'm in Tucson, Arizona, we're, we're hot enough here. Um, people are distinctly saying that their heat tolerance is increasing as they, as they avoid vitamin A longer. And I have that there's like 10 comments on there where people are saying, I don't get the headaches anymore from being out in the sun. I don't, I can tolerate it better. It's, it's really crazy. Um, a lot of the things that we were taught, this, this is just one nutrient that I think was, you know, we get into, was it a mistake? Was it malicious? Are there even more evil intentions behind this poisoning of humanity, as I call it? But it's, it's really quite, quite serious. And, and my, my mission, like, I'm not, nobody's gonna, I'm not gonna make millions telling people not to eat something right the only reason i'm doing this is because ethically morally you know reciprocity wise i have to do it i can't not do it um and as i just see people getting getting i see my son getting better i see my you know my wife improving i i'm improving i see my mom improving i see my clients improving it's it's great getting i have testimonials on the website anecdotes whatever people want to call them <laughs> but all these people are doing the same thing and um it's it's working the biggest driver the funny thing is the biggest driver of the vitamin a toxicity epidemic is glyphosate roundup that's the thing that changed everything so it's not just one thing it's all these things together and that's why when we know what that thing is we can we can remove it and then the body that's the thing, get the hell out of the way. Then the body does it itself. That's all we're trying to do. We're just trying to, we're trying to give the body what it needs, help it get rid of what it doesn't want, and then, you know, get out of the way. One of the signs that vitamin A is something the body doesn't want is the more retinoic acid the body has, the more vitamin A end product it has, the faster it ramps up the processes to try to get rid of it. Hmm. If the body wanted it, it would not do that, right? That doesn't make sense. Why would it try to get rid of it faster when it has more? unless it's toxic. <laughs> so I have, I have, and, and the thing, actually I was listening to John Mark's um, uh, Parasite Proof Government video the other day, and he was talking about, you know, the testimonialism and the omissions, leaving things out. That is what medicine is most guilty of. You know, there, there's the commercials where they tell you, oh, this drug has these side effects and all this. But when you get into, 
like doctors won't even tell people that there's a there's a black box warning on things the most intense warning that the fda can put on something they'll just be like oh you want your kid to take you know your kid's got acne here take accutane right that, which is retinoic acid which is a form of vitamin a that is made in the body from every single form of carotenoid or retinoid or retinol or retinol palmitate that you eat i have the research everything that people hear me say in this podcast or whatever whatever you just i broadcast whatever i can present research to back up every single thing i say and go and, go to dr uh, smith's site for that um yeah, we'll put a link below the video yeah. for your website yeah nutritionrestore.com and then the the blog forum is what i call it because that's where i kind of go on my my well-referenced rants <laughs> and uh but yeah, I want, I want, when people say, I don't believe you all, I'm just like, here it is. Here's the link. Here's the research. Here's why I'm saying this. And they'll, you know. It, and it I highly hit. suggest people don't believe you. I suggest they go into you, get yes. tested, and experiment. Experiment yes. under a controlled situation with a doctor helping you. And, uh, you know, when I was 25, I got very, very ill and I nearly died. Um, at the worst point, I was an entire month unable to get out of bed. I, I literally, I couldn't move. My body, all my joints were swollen. Uh, my digestion was completely not working. I, I couldn't eat food. And the solution was I started experimenting with removing foods. Mm -hmm. I would remove something from my diet. And I, 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 I got, because I was not even lucid. I was unable to concentrate. I got a notepad. I wrote down what I eat. And I started crossing things off. I got down to meat. And a couple of times I was so hungry that I ate it raw. And I ate so much raw meat that I just didn't feel hungry for more meat. And then I felt really good. So I, I even crossed cooking off for a while. Didn't even cook my meat. <laughs> just ate raw meat. You know, my wife would go to the butcher, get it brought home immediately, good quality pasture-raised beef or lamb. And I would eat it the moment it got home. So it was always very fresh. And because of that, I got better, took a while. I, a couple of times I went, say, hey, maybe now I'm a little better. I can go back to eating some of the old, no, kind of stick back to this. And I experimented with it logically and was able to get myself out of that. But for a lot of people, that level of self-experimentation is not reasonable for them to manage themselves and they need help. And right. even I wish that I'd been able to engage a doctor who could help me with the testing. Instead of it taking five years to get better, I might have got better in a year. Is that how long it took? Yeah, it took took me well. It took me about two years to get really, really sick, and five years to get better. <laughs> so, do you want me to talk about what we had what we had talked about on this point? Sure, sure, sure. Okay. So, when when Noah was telling me about this, I was listening, and then he, when he said the raw meat, and he did just raw meat for a while to get better. One of the things back to the vitamin A thing that I know about meat, be well, red meat especially is there's almost no vitamin a in it so what i was thinking when he started telling me about these health problems that he had come to what i my mind knowing what i know i was thinking there was something before he got sick that caused his vitamin a detox pathways to become blocked so any vitamin a that came in was not leaving it was stuck in the system so then when he got that sick and he started crossing off things a lot of the things that he was he was not responding well to were basically either contributing vitamin a to the system whether it was carotenoids or retinoids yeah a lot or of they... tomatoes red peppers <laughs> carrots um bread because it was the glyphosphates yep, yep yep um basically that kind of stuff i was crossing off but he was mentioning before he got sick he had had lots of antibiotics yeah. of different sorts so antibiotics i have i have research showing at least three different classes of antibiotics block or slow down vitamin a metabolism drastically so then we he basically figured out this is why i this is why i'll talk to people like this and say kudos to to noah because he figured out a low vitamin a diet that worked for him and he did it long enough that his problems went away. Now, I'm not, I'm not totally down for myself with the, the quote unquote complete carnivore diet. Um, 
the, the, just the beef, water, and salt, because what I've seen, so you mentioned five years. I can tell you that from the literature, it's, it's fairly well established that a normal level of vitamin A can be completely depleted on a, on a low to no vitamin A diet within about two years. What I've seen with the carnivore approach, I have, I have theories on this because I think certain plant nutrients are needed to help the body to detox the vitamin A. Well, the parsley is a chelating, uh, for example, a chelating mineral uh, uh, plant. Yeah. But. No, it's, it's, more of, it's more of like, um, this, is, this is where I get deeper into the stuff, glucurate, glucaric acid, which is, which is in um, all sorts of foods, especially cruciferous vegetables, apples. You know, it's, it's needed, the, the liver needs glucurate to, a, as the vitamin A is going through the detox pathway, the liver needs glucurate to attach to it so that it can then kick it out of the kidneys. Hmm. So on an, on an all meat diet, you'd be getting none of that. Yeah, apples, so, my, my son has gone an all meat plus apples, uh, occasional bananas, and he'll eat like um, green lettucey stuff, just grab it out of the, out of the, yeah. and eat it. And that's so, so and apples eggs, have lots almost, of lots of eggs. Apples have almost none. Bananas have none. The, the yellow skin, nobody eats that. But, but the banana itself has none. And then what he's eating other than that, like eggs and the greens, has a bit of vitamin A. But like you've been saying, 90%, 95% of his diet is not the vitamin A things. So he's going to be okay. He's staying well below the Yeah, level. he never eats breakfast cereal. He never eats um, – uh, we buy bread that was specifically grown – not even near where glyphosphates were used. It ha uh, it's a company that only grows bread in traditional ways without right. any fertilizer uh, on land that was also been approved. And then they processed the bread with fermentation for a week. And right. so it's really done the way our ancestors ate bread. Yes. Uh, so if I, ate, if I ate a slice of regular bread, I get sick. I start getting the symptoms I had that made me so sick before. One so... If I eat a slice of this, I can eat half a loaf of this bread and I'm fine. So what may be going on, th this is just, this is a theory about, the, this is, the, I'm, I'm, I'll call all sorts of things theories because I have no way of proving them. But either when those symptoms come back so easily, the thing I wonder about the carnivore diet is, the, the all beef kind of thing, beef and lamb. Um, is that it may not allow the vitamin A to get rid of it, it. It gets the vitamin A in your blood way down. So a lot of the symptoms go away, hmm. but it may not be pulling it out of storage. So it what may, would you suggest I eat? To well, apples, apples are probably of all the, of all the fruits and vegetables out there. Apples are probably the most helpful. And I say that because I, I had no idea this existed. I went into the literature on apples there is distinct, there's a distinct body of literature showing that apples are specifically like an anti-disease food. Hmm. So that apple, apple a, day, a day, the doctor, yes, right. It's really actually true. You go, I, I, I have a whole post on it. Hmm. Um, apples and then pears are kind of secondary to apples. And then even bananas have significant, a decent amount of research showing that bananas are healthy. The, you know, the, how many bananas people ate correlating with their health outcomes. Oh, so, I wonder my son loves to eat apples and bananas. That's, those are the two main fruit that I eat, apples, bananas, and pears. That's what I, that's my rotation of fruit. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I, most days I'm eating, you know, bananas, apples, pears, and beef, and maybe uh, a cruciferous vegetable at dinner. And that's, yeah, we like to eat sauerkraut. Yes, yes. And the, yeah, so we get into the acetic acid. I'm not the, the acetobacter in um, sauerkraut, kombucha. Um, what's the other? What's the other cultured kefir. vegetable? Not kefir. Um, apple cider vinegar. Raw apple mm -hmm. cider vinegar. Those. Those. Um, when you ferment plant matter or culture of plant matter, it, it builds up the acetobacter. There's some research showing that acetobacter can actually degrade glyphosate. Hmm. So we get into maybe that's part of why these foods have become so popular in the alternative health communities, because people don't realize how it's helping them, but it seems to be helping. And then well, you and get our into ancestors the ate an awful lot. My ancestors ate an awful lot of sauerkraut. 
And yeah. sometime in my early childhood, nobody was making it anymore. At least you could buy fake ones in the store. But when right. I was a little kid, I ate the sauerkraut from the family. And right. uh, that was normal. Like you grow a garden and you eat about half your cabbages and the other half go into making gigantic fats of sauerkraut. Right. And some, some of it was, you know, it, it may have been a, a, an, advan an advantageous like decision or adaptation, but it was really just to keep the food around longer. Mm -hmm. Right. Cause it was going to go bad. So you had to do something with it. And this is like, this is like purposely making food go bad to, but you can still eat it so you can keep it longer. So, um, but yeah, so, so cultured foods, I, I'm not, I tend to think that, that th they can be overdone. That's the thing about anything. Anything could be overdone. Um, cause there's some people, they eat cultured foods and they, they feel really bloated and other stuff. And I tell them just have a fork full, like uh, even a fork full of sauerkraut is worth like 20 probiotic pills. Yeah. So just, just have a forkful. You do not have to have a whole bowl. Some people um, too, they have a, a difficulty with a histamine response from the bacteria. And I think there's some connection with cortisol as well. I can't remember. And it's, uh, yeah, there, there is a, there is a minimum effective dose and that's what you should be looking to take. It's, it's all vitamin A related. <laughs> hmm. Histamine problems are vitamin A problems. Um, I see people's allergies and other stuff go away all the time. Um, it's as long as they do it long enough, like, just like you were talking about, f you know, five years, I tell people when they're getting on this now, if you're lucky, it's, if you do it right and you're lucky and you're not too toxic, you're probably looking at six months. I, I think I got whatever was making me sick was gone in two years. Yeah. But I was like 220 pounds with, mm -hmm. I'm, um, I was, I'd lost all my muscle and I was that much and I'm not that tall. Uh, five nine, and then my joints were incredibly swollen. Uh, I couldn't wear my wedding wedding ring, nothing like that. And the other three years were, I went from two twenty with no muscle to two hundred with no fat. So it was that was part of the to me that yeah, was yeah. I wasn't right until I was right. Right, right, right. That's why I say yeah, five absolutely. years. Yeah, yeah. No, it was it was all you were doing. You were doing the right thing for yourself, and when when the right things are done, the right things happen. So. You, you know, in a way, you, you gave your body what it needed. You helped it get rid of what it didn't need, and then the magic happens. Yeah. That's I, I went from literally thinking I was going to die. I was hallucinating because I couldn't eat, so I was starving to death. Uh, and I was, I was really, really sick, and I went from that to being very healthy. And I, I think it's important to we talk about these things because there's a lot of people out there with health problems that have gone to traditional doctors. They are not getting solutions to their problems. And they are almost giving up on life. Yes. And Absolutely. that is really sad. You know, they're just giving up. They're just going to muddle through it. And they're suffering unnecessarily. Yes. Most of us can be far healthier than we are. And if we can't think through the process, I'm very smart. So I could read the literature. You know, I, I read the paleo stuff before paleo came out and figured it out. And then they started coming out with that. And I'm like, well, Obviously, that makes sense now why, why what I did worked. Um, but not everyone can do that. And even if you could, I wish I had help. It would have been a faster process. And go to, you know, if someone goes to a doctor like you, they, if you don't have any, any hope anymore because things have been going so badly, you have nothing to lose. Right, right. Go and look. I, I, wish, I wish more people would come to me before they try all the and I mean this in just the, the, they kind of do the lazy ways, right? They just give me a pill, just do the surgery, just give me a pill, do whatever. It's kind of, you know, and I, I tell people that I believe that, you know, if a dog, if you had a dog and the dog's in pain and you say to the, the dog, look, you can do six, six months of physical therapy to fix your leg pain and it's going to hurt and it's not, you know, it's not going to be fun. It's going to hurt. Or you can take this pain pill every day. I truly believe that the dog would pick the pain pill. You know, it's, it's a much higher order of thinking to have to pick, like, if I want to fix this problem, I have to, you know, it's going to take longer and it's going to take Animals more work. Animals always take the easy way out because right. they have no agency. Yes. When you have no agency, you always take the easy way out. Yes. And that's okay for, for animals. That works for animals because – they're designed so that a certain percentage of the population can die off and then they just get replaced by new ones. And that happens amongst humans too, but you'd like to not be, have to be the one that, <laughs> you'd like to not be the example of what doesn't work. 
You know, right. if you want to be the example of what works, uh, you're going to have to demonstrate your agency. You're going to have to, um, you know, I've, I've been giving some thought to this. I'm going to write a post about it. Uh, there's, we have high and low agency, but we also have long and short time preference, high, high and low time preference. Right. And there are people with higher agency with a very high time preference. And they're able to go out and get stuff done, but they're not thinking about tomorrow. And I, I see this sometimes in entrepreneurs. They're like, uh, in six months, my business is going to go public. I'm going to make my IPO and I'm trying, or I'm trying to sell it, or I'm trying to get this investor. Just give me a pill that helps me get from now until then with preferably without sleeping, <laughs> you know, Gah. and, and yeah. this is, this is what they want. They're, they're making this massive sacrifice of long-term health for short-term gains. The problem with that is, is that life is a series of six month challenges. The moment that they pass that six month challenge, there's going to be another one come up after it and another one after that. And the people who don't burn out after two or three cycles, they're going to figure out there's something wrong with this and they're going to change how they live. Yes. Uh, you know, ideally it's a, it's a hundred, ideally your life is a hundred year marathon, you know, not a 30 year sprint. Right. And if you look at it that way, and you think to yourself, you know, I got to make, I, I'm thinking right now, I go to the gym and I squat at 40 so that I can get out of my chair at 80. Right. You know, I'm making choices now because of 40 years in the future. Uh, my wife's about to give birth to twins. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to be 60 and I'm going to have two 20 year old sons. If I want to keep up with them, I got to look after my health. Yes. I got to stay strong or it's, or, or, or they're going to, you know, they're going to have an old grandpa for a dad. So it's, it's, um, it's important that we, we have that, the, the correct vision of healthcare as a long arc throughout our life. And you, we talked about philosophy. Um, it's a good idea for individuals to give thought to what is their philosophy for looking after their health. What is their personal health philosophy? Is it give me a pill so I can get by till tomorrow because I might die, you know, right. for today, for tomorrow you may die? Or is it, uh, I want to, I want to be happy in my old age and healthy in my old age. And I'm going to figure these pro I'm going to invest the time in figuring out what's wrong now. So I make it that far. Right. You know? I always like to think that the healthier somebody is when the time comes to die, it tends to be very quick. Hmm. You know, I, I, I don't want to be one of those people where I slowly am losing, you know, it's like cyst body system after body system just keeps failing and life is, you know, life has been terrible for 20 years, but yeah, you live 20 years, but life has been terrible for 20 years. I tend to see that, you know, like when, when people are quite healthy, when they're under some kind of life, potentially life threatening trauma or something like that, they either tend to die because it's too much or the doctors are like, wow, it must have been because you were so healthy, you got through this and you're doing great and all that. And so I'm kind of like, I would rather, you know, the whole, you could get hit by a bus tomorrow. I'm like, well, I hope it either takes me out or I'll, or I'll kind of come back from, yeah, or I bounce yeah. back from it. So, you know, I don't want to be the one who I break my leg and then I just slowly can't walk. And then, then my health starts going down because when people stop walking, their health just, you know, goes down because the leg doesn't heal. Yeah. The, the worst, the worst fear that I would have in old age is uh, spending a decade unable to walk. Yeah. Yeah, that, I don't, that would be terrible. That's, that's worse than prison. Yeah. I mean, I'd be okay if I had no legs and that's why I couldn't walk because at least right. I could you know, hobble around in my hands. But if I really, I was just laying in bed for a decade, you might as well be dead. Right. You know, it's, it's certainly not happy. Uh, my, my great grandmother in her 90s, she, she used to go up and down the stairs of her apartment on her own. And we used to say, hey, wait for us. We'll come and you know, give you an arm and help you down. But she didn't want to wait for other people. She's like, I can do it myself. Right. Well, in her 90s, she fell down two flights of stairs and like half her blood came out because, you know, even if you're yeah. young, that's going to hurt. It's concrete steps in an old apartment building, Stone, I think. And um, now she completely recovered, lived another two years. Wow. Then fell down again and died. Uh, well, yeah, you know. But see, she went out the way she wanted to. Yes. You know, and and she was she was tough as nails. Um but that this is uh, having that health until you're old. You got to put effort into it. It doesn't happen by accident. Yes, absolutely. It does, I, well, I, I mean, there's 
I've heard, I've heard a connection too. Speaking about one thing I remember, I heard a connection between alcoholism and vitamin A as well that, and, and if I remember correctly, it was levels of vitamin A corresponded to how high cravings were for alcohol. Have you heard anything about that before? Well, this is, I, I hadn't heard about it. I want, I'm going to go look at it now. Okay. Where, what was, I want to make sure the, was it the higher the level of vitamin A, the more craving? I, I, I can't remember what, if it was high or low, but it was connected to that. Um, I, I, I want to look that up. Okay. So here's, here's the lowdown on vitamin A and alcohol. Alcohol, study after study shows that alcohol depletes vitamin A mm. in the body. So it would make sense. Well, if it's high and you feel like depleting some vitamin A. Right. Maybe if, that's if we why were... the Vikings who ate cod liver oil could drink so much and not die from it. Yeah. Then we get into as long as they had enough molybdenum and all, you know, it's yeah. all this, all these things. But so we get into, so alcohol, alcohol is alcohol, right? Ethanol. Retinol is the alcohol form of vitamin A. Mm. They both go through the same enzyme. They call it alcohol dehydrogenase. But just because the scientists want to confuse people, sometimes in some studies, they'll call it retinol dehydrogenase. Hmm. But the, the generic big term is alcohol dehydrogenase. And it, they just renamed it for certain studies. I don't understand why they did it. So anyway, so it goes through the same pathway. And when alcohol goes through alcohol dehydrogenase, it tends to ramp up the speed of the enzyme, it ramps up the detox of it. Cause you know, you put in alcohol, your body wants to detox it. So it ramps up the detox speed. Being that retinol goes through the same enzyme. If you were getting toxic in retinol, let's say in your body, and we believe that the body is wise, then the body would say, well, if you put in some more alcohol, we'll ramp up this enzyme and we'll help to get rid of it more. So if, if that's what you were saying, so we also have interesting studies where they show that teetotalers, people who don't drink at all, and people who drink too much, die sooner than people who just drink a bit. Yeah. And then we start going, well, maybe, maybe too much alcohol is a poison in and of itself, which it probably is. You know, we can all pretty much agree that too much alcohol is not a good thing. But no alcohol allows for more vitamin A to build up. You know, it's interesting. Um, if you go past mud hut level civilizations, there's not been any civilization in history that hasn't had alcohol. <laughs> yeah, I, it seems like wherever we get more than a mud hut going, step, step two is let's start making alcohol. Let's make, ferment something and drink it. I saw a book about like sacred medicines and these herbal beers yesterday. I thought that was interesting. I was going to look into that after another book I was going to look into. But yeah, yeah so the alcohol one, thing. One day I'm going to ferment some beer without hops in it, some uh, testosterone boosting beer. Nice. Um, well, I, there's, yeah, I'm looking into something that comes out of hops called xanthohumol now because I'll, I'll hear about these interesting compounds. Cannabidiol is another one. I, you know, I'm not going to get into it here, but I don't trust cannabidiol long term at all. Um, but xanthohumol is an interesting compound from hops that seems to have a lot of antioxidant capacity. Hmm. And it's one of two things. When I see these things, it either helps get rid of vitamin A or it protects against it, or it actually is simply storing it in the tissues, which has the effect of helping people feel better and symptoms go away until the can can't be kicked down the road anymore and the liver's full and then everything falls apart. Hmm. And then people don't know what's going on. That's what that's what I believe is going to and based on the research. Detox even harder because you're not just detoxing liver. You're every time you detox, you're just going to pull more out of the storage. Well, you're gonna yeah. So if you're putting it in, this is going to be the problem. If people don't know the vitamin A thing, and let's say they take can, CBD cannabidiol, and I have the paper showing it stores it in the liver. One single dose of um a big dose of vitamin A and a single, they gave them an injection of CBD and they saw ink. They actually, no, wait, I'm sorry. They didn't give them vitamin A. They just gave them the shot of CBD and they saw more vitamin A in the liver. Hmm. So, and then there's new studies coming out showing the CBD seems to be liver damaging. Hmm. Are there any coincidences? No. Um, so anyway, but, this is the way I, I have to look at these things now is because certain things I've gotten into thinking they were going to be good 
turned out to just be kind of a kicking the can down the road. They made people feel better because they acted on vitamin A, but it wasn't in the right way. And then, uh, and then when, when people, on that example, when people, when the CBD, let's say, has filled up the liver with vitamin A, and then they're still taking the CBD and they're still eating vitamin A. So there's vitamin A coming in. There is, um, if they take the CBD, at some point the CBD, they notice the benefits go away and their old problems start coming back. That's when the liver has totally filled up. So the blood levels are starting to rise because it doesn't matter how much CBD you take, you can't shove it into the liver. So then, CBD is coming in, trying to shove it in, vitamin A is coming in, and then the CBD is not working anymore. And then if they stop the CBD at all, then the liver starts dumping it out into the system. And now so they've got even- the amount in the bloodstream because you have what you're consuming plus what it's dumping. And then their old problems are worse than they've ever been. So then they take the CBD again, just to get back to the crappy point that they were at. <laughs> <laughs> and comes this, and then they don't know how to get out of it because they don't know what the poison is. Mm -hmm. Because you know, how could how could something that's called that's part of the I, we talked about the brainwashing and the propaganda. When you call something a vitamin, and every time you say the word, you have to say vitamin. You get where I'm going with this, right? Vital, you have, vital, you are vital, vital amines, right? And you are you have brain you are brainwashing yourself every time you say it into having to convince yourself it's bad because how could a vitamin be bad? Not only a bad, it's vitamin A. It's the first one. Number one, and and well, let's let's think about that for a second. When do we tend to make mistakes? Is it early on in our learning or is it later? The biggest mistakes, right? It tends to be early, right? So the very first vitamin, they didn't even know what they were looking for. And I actually have I have several other theories that there was actually a lot of vitamin A in the casein protein they fed these mice and the diet was completely lacking in zinc and taurine, which also affect the eyes and are also essential nutrients. And that's, that was the mistaken conclusion they came to was because they, they were ter how, how could they know that something was free of vitamin A when they didn't even know what vitamin A was, right? They're yeah. discovering it. So how can they be good at chemically analyzing it? Well, even now, chemical analyzations of um, naturally sourced vitamins is very complex because you can only test for a certain variation on the chemical, yes. whereas in a plant, you might have 50 different variations of that chemical in different amounts, and to test for each variation is prohibitively expensive. I, I just saw the other day in a paper that um, there are 4,000 plus members of the carotenoid retinoid vitamin a family yeah and, and let's they only say that, let's say the tomato has a hundred different members right how much vitamin a is in a tomato we don't know right we don't well, know for they... a couple of reasons we don't know because how big is your tomato where was it grown and what kind of soil and how much sun did it get and which variety of tomato was it and then also um there's 50 or 100 different types of vitamin a in there and we we can't test all of them we'll just test one of them Right. And we're right. going to give you an answer. And when you have that many unknown variables, it is impossible to have anything that approximates the truth. Noah, I got to, I got to, we got to wrap this up. I got to yeah. get, I got a client waiting for me. No problem. <laughs> That's excellent. Um, so you, we can reach Dr. Smith at the links that I'm going to put below in the video. Please like this, uh, and this, this uh, video and subscribe to my channel because that way you get all of these kind of interviews as we come out with them. And thank you very much, Dr. Smith. For joining us today and we really appreciate the information that you brought for us my pleasure have a great evening